You are listening to the API The Docs podcast. We are here to talk about API documentation upstream and downstream. At the beginning, I was just trying to get through my class with 25 MIT undergraduates. But ultimately, when you get to Google and you've got tens of thousands of engineers to teach, you always have to be thinking about scaling. I have been perhaps overly concerned in technical education with trying to figure out how to hold people's attention. And I think I learned a fair amount of that just by doing shows. And you begin to come up with your own mental models of performing, which I keep applying to technical education. I think there is a strong culture of improvement and iteration within engineering. It's just, I think, drummed in as part of an engineer's training that we're always going to try to make this better. We're going to give feedback and it's a healthy environment for a writer to work in. Hello and welcome to the API The Docs podcast. Your hosts today are myself, Onet Pujar, and my colleague, Laura Vash. In our daytime jobs, we research and be a developer portals at Pronovix. Hi, Laura. Hi, Onet. Mm, and hi, Barry. So our guest today is Barry Rosenberg. He's a staff technical writer at Google, uh, specializing in courses for software engineers. For five years, he focused on developing courses about machine learning and the TensorFlow API. Before that, Barry wrote fairly extensively about APIs, programming languages, shell scripting, and graphics. And he also has extensive experience in teaching, both in academia and for corporations. Uh, we're really thrilled for uh, to talk with him today. And uh, welcome, Barry, and thank you for coming. So nice to be here. I'm very delighted to be here and uh, and talking to both of you. How are you today? Oh, we're well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the birds are chirping, spring is coming, the crocuses are full out, and our cats are hunting for bees. And we really? are excited because we are having you, so. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, like you said, this is your first time, Barry, on the uh, interviewed side of the microphone. So this is also a new experience for you. But when did you get started teaching technical writers to engineers? Because that's how we got to invite you here. Um, what's the motivation that's driving you in uh, teaching that? Why is it important, you think, for teaching engineers to write? Yeah, about uh, a little over 20 years ago, I taught technical writing at MIT, and my students were undergraduates. They majored in science or engineering, and I came to appreciate that uh, engineers and scientists have to spend an enormous amount of their professional life doing writing, and yet colleges and universities don't really prepare scientists and engineers for that life. So uh, I taught four semesters at MIT. I began to get a sense during that time of what was difficult to learn, what was easy to learn. Uh, I ended up writing a book for Pearson Publishing about technical writing for scientists and engineers. Um, then I, I, I guess I kind of went out on the road with that book uh, in that I taught technical writing at various corporations around the U.S. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I got to Google, realized that I was in a real life situation where I could help engineers learn how to write better and make their jobs a little bit easier. And so uh, a colleague of mine, Ricardo Olanu, and I sat down in 2015, and we created a tech writing course for engineers. And it that was, was the first one at Google. The, yeah, there were there was another tech writing course uh, before ours. Uh, excellent question, and it was a well received class, but it hadn't it hadn't caught on in a in a significantly big way. Uh, it hadn't been taught that much, and we were looking for a highly scalable class that we could teach to thousands of engineers at Google. Mm -hmm. So we experimented with the format quite a bit until we, boy, was there a lot of iteration um, and change. And 
we came up with a course that was rather different from the course that we started with, uh, but ultimately I think we found a fairly decent formula uh, for mm -hmm. teaching tech writing to software engineers. So this idea of scaling has been on your mind from the beginning? Well, at the beginning, I was just trying to get through my class with, with 25 MIT undergraduates. Uh, but ultimately, when you get to Google and you're, you've got tens of thousands of engineers to teach, you always have to be thinking about scaling. You have to be thinking, how can I take whatever it is that I know or wh I, whatever it is I want to teach to Google software engineers and how to get lots and lots of them to take that education. So I think that was the biggest challenge for us. It's relatively easy to sit down in a class, one teacher with 10 students and, hey, let's individually work on writing assignments and I can give you a lot of feedback on those assignments. It's a whole nother thing to try to figure out how to get 10,000 people through that, through that program. Well, and get them into it first, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unless it's on a Friday. Um, <laughs> so um, it was your colleague, Sharif Shala, who uh, introduced you um, to us as uh, one of the leads on the Google Tech Writing Courses uh, project, which was the scalable um, solution now. And I myself heard about this first, uh, someone in the middle of 2019. That was at my understanding, still in the middle of taking shape. Uh, this was at Right the Docs, um, where Sharif, who is uh, often attending, he started an ideating uh, session together with Abby Suberland. Uh, she created um, a similar tech writing, internal technical writing curriculum for TomTom. Tom. Mm -hmm. And so they were exploring from the technical writers there themselves what they think would be the needs, what would be a good way to do this. And the idea was to create a, a very scalable route and resources to having more and more people to be able to create technical documentation. But from Sharif, I understood this was also not just that people could learn, but that they could teach this. And then since then, it became quite impressive. So at what step did you get involved in this? And, and what was the need that was really pressing this? Well, um... At Google, we introduced, uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to explore this question without getting into too many Google secrets here. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's only public. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I'll just say that there was a sudden need for Google software engineers to write even more documentation than they had in the past. So we had tons of engineers who had to write an awful lot of stuff and we needed to try to figure out how could we improve the quality of all this documentation that software engineers were producing. And you have very strict stride guides and also not just any writing. Yes. Yeah. And so the engineers were writing about all manner of challenging technical uh, information. And uh, I would have been challenged even as a tech writer who has done this sort of thing for several decades. I would have been very challenged to be writing about what the software engineers were trying to tackle without any formal technical writing training. So yeah, it was a daunting challenge. Um, Sharif came on the project about two years ago, has been extraordinarily helpful. Uh, he understands engineers <laughs> extremely well and what they'll get and what they won't get. Uh, so he has helped shape our course offerings very well. So uh, getting back to uh, scale, though, um, I think a large part of what we're trying to do is to get technical writers very interested in teaching these courses themselves at their own enterprises, at their own universities or or, or software companies. Uh, so we have fairly extensive material for instructors to help get them booted up mm -hmm. uh, so that they can go out and, uh, and teach engineers where they are. It's really interesting because it's not about learning, but teaching. 
Um, just to be sure, can you tell the precise name of the courses and where do people find them? <laughs> yes, first things first. Thank you so much for that question. Yes, um, the, the names of the courses are now Technical Writing 1 and Technical Writing 2. So you can find them just by doing a search engine, going to your favorite search engine and looking for Google's Technical Writing 1 and Technical Writing 2. That would be the easiest way. The URL is not quite as short as I would like it to be. Thank you. For whom are these resources and why is there a course 1 and a course 2? All right. So Technical Writing 1 are the critical basics of technical writing. And it's for any software engineer who's just getting going in technical writing, or possibly a uh, software engineer who took a technical writing class long, long ago and wants a quick refresher. Technical Writing 2 is more of an intermediate technical writing course. Mm -hmm. And we want people to have already taken Technical Writing 1 before they take Technical Writing 2. It's not completely essential. We don't check, certainly, at the door. But it's uh, it's a great idea to take Tech Writing 1 before Tech Writing 2. That's also for software engineers. Uh, we do get a few scientists in our, in our classes. Um, Google itself has plenty of research scientists. And when we teach these classes outside of Google, uh, a certain percentage of our class are, are science students rather than classic software engineers. And is there going to be a Tech Writing 3 or what new Tech Writing courses are you currently creating? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. We are working on something, um, a very cool course. We are not sure yet whether we'll call it Tech Writing 3 or we'll call it Revenge of the Jedi. I, I don't know what we're going to call it yet, uh, but it will be a far more advanced course than Tech Writing 1 and Tech Writing 2. Is there any special parts about API documentation? Um, that's yet another thing we're working on. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> and that's really in a very preliminary state. So I don't want to talk about that one too, too much. But mm -hmm. yes, that's very... A uh, very, very important topic for engineers. Since when is this course available? Like a, about a year now? Yeah. Uh, so we had the good fortune <laughs> to release the course. Uh, I think it was February 25th, right before the global pandemic started. And good timing. We had, it was such good timing. We had all these plans to do public courses for teachers all over the world and get uh, an army of teachers to go out and and teach this. And we hadn't, we didn't have a virtual version of the course. It was always intended to be taught live. Mm -hmm. And um, so we were extremely depressed, our team for about a month, and then said, all right, maybe this, maybe this whole video conferencing thing will take off. And um, we created a virtual version of the class and have been teaching it, I think, since about April. Mm -hmm. Did you get any feedback or actually people who didn't write before technical documentation and because of this course are now uh, doing that? Um, I have not heard that in particular. We get extensive feedback from people. We have thousands of survey respondents within Google mm -hmm. who tell us what they like and didn't like about the course and uh, how we violated uh uh, some pet writing peeve of theirs is a fairly common. The semi <laughs> Oh, don't don't get me started. And incidentally, I'm very pro semicolon. Don't care how many people hate me, but I love the semicolon. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, unfortunately, or you no, know, in case a lawyer is listening to this, um, as it happens, I am. Um, we are not allowed to survey people outside of Google. So, mm -hmm. uh, about the course. So, um, I, you know, I get immediate feedback from students right after they take the class. And I do, I usually, when I teach external classes, I give out my email address and people find me on LinkedIn and 
tell me this and that, but it's 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 really just anecdotal at this uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, if someone's listening to this and have um, some results, like um, success stories, where would they be able to tell that to you? Well, uh, the easiest way is just to go to my Google email, and I am Barry R at Google dot com, and drop me a line. And is it a prerequisite uh, to have a engineering background or a scientific background, no. or is it suitable for changing careers, maybe transitioning to technical? What a great question. Yes, we are hoping, and we have seen uh, a few students, particularly outside of Google, have taken a class who are interested. What is this technical writing thing I've been hearing about? I'm a, I'm a wonderful writer. I'm a journalist. Uh, I write in, in, in my job, and I'd like to get into the technical writing part. I think the course is slightly more challenging for someone who has never done programming before. Uh, particularly technical writing too, because it does involve writing uh, a quick programming tutorial. So it, I think it would be challenging if you've never written a line of code. Uh, you don't have to be a formal software engineer, though, to take the class. So a little bit of familiarity with programming is certainly helpful, though. Mm -hmm. On Monday, uh, this Monday, so that was one, two, three, four days ago, uh, we had the first... I don't know if you can call it consolidated meetup. Uh, the Writer Docs meetups uh, for cities, they are uh, now, um, well, kind of uh, having a hibernation uh, <laughs> for a year. And several of the organizers uh, said, okay, also in the Europe, Middle East, Africa region, we would like to start up one together. And so Monday was the first one, and we have an interesting panel talk about what uh, skills and abilities do technical writers need to do technical writing? Like, what makes a technical writer? Yeah. And talking about soft skills and, and, and hiring, it was kind of a, a resounding agreement from the panel that one would be curiosity mm. and the other one would be empathy. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, and uh, one of the panel members said that she actually hired several journalists uh, as technical writers because they have these qualities. Yeah. Yeah, I would hope they would. Yes. <laughs> I think empathy is just terribly important for technical writers, just to get into the shoes of their readers, which is often extremely difficult. Um, I do agree. But it, it's, it's the, I think the key way to write great programming guides is to do what your readers have to do with the API. Uh, sit down and write applications with that API and understand where the hard parts are, where you got frustrated, and those are the places where you devote most of the pixels in your writing to. Yeah, definitely. At Google, you are also the host of an internet podcast series where you interview famous Googlers, so you are on the other side of the microphone. Can you tell yeah. us more about that? Since when are you doing this podcast and, and why? Yeah, so I was, there's a place called the Stevens Creek Trail uh, near the Googleplex in Mountain View, California. And it, it's a beautiful path. And I was walking with um, a video producer named Mark Chow. This was about seven years ago and we were trying to brainstorm new things to do with uh, video. And at that point, podcasts were, they were getting going. They certainly weren't where they are now. And we when, started talking when is about, that? so we're going back to probably late in 2013. And we decided, well, why don't we try a, a, a preliminary podcast and just see how it goes. And we decided that, well, he's he's an engineer, he's a video engineer. Uh, he would take care of the engineering, the production and post-production. And I had done some interviewing before. Uh, I would take care of being the host of the show. And so we started off slowly. We were trying to figure out what, what this new medium was all about for us. 
we did a few interviews with people who interested us. And then we were lucky enough, or I can't remember where in the sequence, fourth guest, fifth guest, was the um, inventor, Ray Kurzweil, uh, who was very well known within Google. And uh, we <laughs> had a fairly engaging chat with Mr. Kurzweil. And from there, we were able to pitch to other fairly well-known Googlers and say, hey, Ray Kurzweil appeared on our show. Uh, wouldn't you like to appear on? Oh, Ray Kurzweil appear on the show? Yes, of course <laughs> we'd like to appear on the show. And uh, since that time, we've been amazingly lucky with uh, the people we've been able to talk with. We've done about, I think we're around 65 or 70 podcasts at this point. We do about 10 a year. Uh, and it's you know, usually the highlight of my month when I'm able to do one of the interviews. By coincidence, I'm doing an interview later today with uh, a well-known Googler, and I'm, I'm very excited to uh, be able to interview her. And these are strictly internal? They are strictly internal. Why? We have talked about the possibility of externalizing some of them. Um, it's... Uh, uh, something of a challenge to take internal information. We want, when we interview people within Google, we want them to have the freedom to talk about whatever they want to talk about. And sometimes when you like future go strategy outside, outside right? yeah, when you go mm -hmm. outside, you have to um, um, be a little more um, discriminating. Call certain things about. with the revenge <laughs> of the death, right? Yes, <laughs> yes. And um, did working as an entertainer shape your view of course development? Did you find a connection? Yeah, I was a uh, long time ago. I was a juggler and I traveled around. I primarily worked in, in my, my town, Boston, but I did travel around quite a bit. And I did, I think, lifetime about 1,200 shows. And they were all... You know, there are live 12, shows. 1,200, yeah. Okay. So oh. Oh. they were uh, heavily street shows, busking. And um, I had a lot of fun with it. But relevant to your question, yeah, I learned the importance in educational development, even technical education development of the key factor if you don't have the audience's attention no matter how good your <laughs> your pitch is no matter how important your information is if people aren't listening it's a waste of time so i have been perhaps over overly concerned in technical education with trying to figure out how to hold people's attention and i think i learned a fair amount of that just by doing shows. And a great part about shows is you get instant feedback from your audience if it's a live show. This joke worked, this didn't work. The audience started to get bored at this point. The audience was highly engaged at this point. What happened? And you begin to come up with your own mental models of performing, which I keep applying to technical education. How do you see the state of the attention when it's an offline course when it's an offline course i mean course? during the course like i lost you on this question or this is the point where somehow people just don't get through yeah that's that's a great question like on a street you would see how long the eyes are following the balls right but yeah what if about I can't, if i can't course? see the students faces when yeah. when they're looking at the material well, I've had a great advantage in developing Tech Writing 1 and Tech Writing 2. That uh, The courses are half, um, half self-study offline, and they're half with uh, some form of an instructor. So the advantage of, well, I, th I think this is working anywhere with software engineers. They're not shy about uh, criticism. So I... Uh, I and Sharif and Tina and the other people who work on these courses, we are often flooded with feedback 
uh, particularly internally from people who have taken the course and say, I don't understand this, or I disagree with this. And we have had feedback from hundreds of software engineers to help us refine exactly what's working, what isn't. In terms of attention, we can follow along to some degree with Google Analytics mm -hmm. and find out if people are going through linearly. They generally are not, uh, but we can see a bit of a drop off for the few people who are going linearly and try to figure out where they're, where we're losing them, mm -hmm. where we've lost their attention, or possibly it's not attention. It's just they only have. 20 minutes, they're they're on a break between two assignments and they, they have 20 minutes right there to devote to getting a little better at tech writing and that's all we have them for. Mm -hmm. um, but the level of criticism we have received on these courses has been phenomenal in helping to shape these things. Uh, with instructor-led, even if it's virtual, we are able to see the students interacting and uh, we do get a pretty good sense, even in a virtual class, of whether it's working or not working. I wonder if the same can be said for API documentation, like getting feedback and, and user journey research is a, is a huge thing in API docs and, and actually having to the point, this is where my attention broke, uh, is it's a big thing. Uh, yeah. I'm, this outspokenness, do you think that's um, sort of in per se culture in Google or this has more to do with software development as you said so? I think if I had developed the course at another company, uh, particularly a company that had tens of thousands of, of software engineers, I think I would have gotten would the, get the same, same level uh -huh. of feedback. I don't think it's specific to Google, but I think there is a strong culture of improvement and iteration within the Within, it or, uh, within engineering, it's just, I think, drummed in as part of an engineer's uh, training that we're always going to try to make this better. We're going to give feedback. And it's a, it's a healthy environment for a writer to work in. Yeah. You mentioned something interesting while we were preparing for this interview that you think that podcasting is a natural medium for technical writers and for me that was well i've been i've been sitting with that for a while ever since i saw that because for me it seems a bit counterintuitive but i, I can also imagine your point so how how do you see that yeah i think getting back to what annette said earlier about uh a curiosity uh as a key trait for technical writers Mm -hmm. I think when I go into a podcast, that's my biggest strength. I'm curious. I have questions I want to ask, particularly about technology. It is not all that different from all the interviews I've done with software engineers over the years, where I'm asking them very specific questions about how an API works. This is just those interviews with other people listening, basically. And I am always trying to Getting back to the second uh, important criteria for technical writers, empathy, I am always trying to put myself in the shoes of my listeners, in this case, rather than my readers. What would they want to know? What, what would they be curious about? And I think it, it couldn't be more natural for tech writers to get into podcasting. Um, you know, hopefully they have a, a background, some sort of background in communication or entertainment or something, but it just feels like a complete extension of what I've done forever as a technical writer. Mm -hmm. The different medium. It's a little hard to refrain from gold plating the end result, though. <laughs> well, I and I do hope you'll gold plate um, this interview, though. With <laughs> At the beginning, you mentioned you wrote several books on the topic. Can you talk us a bit more about? Yeah, this is going way, way back. Uh, there was a shell that uh, called the corn shell, and it was really pretty much what Bash uh, became. Uh, and the corn shell was in vogue in the, the 80s and 90s. Uh, it's still around. If, you, if you're on a Linux terminal and you type KSH, almost certainly a corn shell will 
will appear and will look will react almost indistinguishably from a, a bash shell. At any rate, I wrote a book called Corn Shell Programming Tutorial long, long ago. And um, it was my first work with a publishing company. It was uh, <laughs> really a brutal experience trying to uh, go through all the iterations of that book until it was publishable. It was taking what I had known about technical writing to a, another level. And I got to work with the inventor of the corn shell, whose name is, is Corn, David Corn. And um, we had a kind of a lengthy correspondence through different iterations of, of my book. And many, many years later, uh, I met David Corn because he was working at Google. And I did a podcast interview with him. And that was my first face-to-face -face meeting with him. And I ended up writing a sequel for a later version of Corn Shell, uh, Corn Shell 93. And I worked on that book a little bit uh, with David Corn's son, Jeff Corn, who uh, ended up working at Google. And I ended up doing a podcast with him. Uh, just a few months ago. Um, at any rate, uh, I did very much enjoy the whole process of writing books, even though it was really, really hard. But back in those days, there were, you know, many bookstores that featured programming language books and, and API books. And it was such a thrill the first time I saw my book in a, in a real brick and mortar bookstore. And after I wrote a book on client-server computing for technical professionals, um, it was a little early for that book, unfortunately. And then in 2000, 2005, I believe, I wrote a book called Technical Writing for Engineers and Scientists. And uh, that was a fun one that um, I got to put a little more of my personality into that one. I, I enjoyed that one quite a bit. Uh, also a very tough one to write, but uh, uh, but a lot of fun. And do you also write fiction? Yeah, yeah, that's that's my big avocation. I come home from come home. Well, I'm always home during the pandemic, but in a virtual way, I come home and after a day of writing, there's nothing better to do than a night of writing. So, yeah, I like to write uh, novels and short stories. I've written four uh, desperately unpublished novels and probably unpublishable novels. And uh, lately, I've switched over to short stories because they're shorter. Um, yes, this that was an important insight, I feel. Um, and... Uh, I, it's just fun to be able to work on a short story for six weeks and then move on to something else because the novels took me six or seven years each to write. And it's a lengthy time to spend on one topic with one group of characters. I'm just wondering, uh, does it have an effect on, I mean, writing fiction on your perspective or take on technical writing? Yeah, I... Do not always hear positive things about tech writers who write fiction. And there's some, there's some trope that uh, tech writers who write fiction aren't really serious about doing tech writing. But I find it the opposite. I think if you write fiction, uh, it does help your tech writing. I am completely in favor of writing engaging technical writing. And I think the practice of doing fiction writing and working very hard on crafting sentences and trying to make them engaging and fascinating to the reader can only help, help you as a technical writer. And you got to be friends with the forces of the ether. <laughs> Leave a plate of milk sometimes in front of the server boxes. I don't want to get on their bad sides, Laura. <laughs> Barry, thank you very much for this interview. I hope that the one you're going to have with someone uh, goes very well today. And for 
the information you gave us about the technical writing courses. I hope it keeps continuing being a success. You may get some outside GDPR proof success stories from uh, our listeners. I am looking forward to them. And it's been such a delight to talk to both of you. I am, I am looking forward to, to hearing this. <laughs> the gold plated version. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. Thanks again to our guest, to Pronovix, for letting us work on this, and the entire API The Docs community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website apidocs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well.